Good evening, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Beijing. There's a parade underway right now as we speak, and that parade is a focus of our beginning conversation, but I point to the fact that this parade, while it is strutting and chest-beating by the Communist Party, it refers to the past, and that's important because it's provocative in Asia. The future is right now. There is the report of five warships of the PLA Navy operating in the Bering Sea, that's the coast of Alaska, that's the land bridge between Siberia and the United States and Alaska, while the President of the United States is in Alaska. Perhaps it's a coincidence, perhaps, as Gore Vidal taught me once upon a time, no reason for the word conspiracy, John, just write it down as one of those things. Gordon Chang of Forbes.com contributor joins me. Gordon, five warships in the Bering Sea while the President's in Alaska. If you're making gestures by the PLA Navy, is this your moment to get into a headline while the Army's enjoying all the attention in Beijing? Well, perhaps, John, because clearly what you have in Beijing right now is about 11,000 goose-stepping, stone-faced soldiers who are about to go into the spiritual heart of China, Tiananmen Square, to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. We welcome Arthur Waldron, Lauder Professor of International Relations, the Department of History at the University of Pennsylvania, because what Gordon just said has a twist in it. There's a little detail here about the celebration in Beijing. That is, that this is a fiction. Gore, Arthur, a very good evening to you. The fiction of the Communist Party. Down the memory hole, is this new speak in the 21st century? Good evening to you, Arthur. Uh, I was trying to think of a parallel from European history, and this would be almost as if uh, France uh, had a celebration of its victory on land uh, against German forces in World War II, uh, because uh, actually the French did fight, but the communists who are sponsoring this parade are uh, uh, claiming to do, have done, they're claiming credit for something that they never had had they had almost nothing to do with, uh, namely Chinese resistance to the Japanese. Uh, their political opponents, uh, who were the legal government of China at the time, uh, shed almost all the blood. Even so, they didn't win. All they did was fail to lose. It was the United States that defeated Japan. Yeah, so let's get this straight, Arthur. Basically, you have Xi Jinping, who is the ruler of China, the general secretary of the Communist Party, is going to preside over this massive celebration. He is in direct line from Mao Zedong, who was the founder of the People's Republic, who spent World War II essentially hunkered down in some caves in Yan'an. He was, and he was hi hiding out. He was Northwest. hiding out as far from the Japanese as you could get and still be in China. And he occupied his time chasing his future wife and giving worthless lectures on how to write to a group of writers who didn't need the lectures. And, and right, the Communist Party during World War II, what the Chinese now call the War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression, we didn't have anything to do with by, by beating Japan, by the way, in the Communist Party narrative. But what's really hideous about this is that the Communist Party basically had only one sustained offensive campaign against Japan. And really, this is just, you can't make this stuff up. Mao Zedong actually punished the general for fighting it because he wanted them to avoid fighting Japan. That's right. When the war broke out in August of 1937, Communist Party had a, me a secret meeting south of Yan'an, the Luochuan Conference, at which Mao told his generals that they were not to fight the Japanese head on which is this means you basically that you don't fight them the generals objected and they were told to be quiet one of them in december of nineteen forty launched a campaign which was not a major campaign but which gave was a real fight and gave the japanese a bit of a bloody nose and when he got back to yanan he was politically uh... attacked and then kept grounded for the rest of the war uh, and then uh, he came out again, basically to beat us in Korea, and then he was grounded again and died a horrible death, uh, for one of the great generals at the PLA. So they are uh, 
They're celebrating it's, it's, a victory it's, it's, they didn't win. Above. It is, is appalling to me. I mean, they, this is the hijacking of somebody else's holiday. And, and then and to make this even worse, you have on the reviewing stand in Beijing, you have Vladimir Putin. Now, his predecessor, you know, from Russia to the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union actually did fight the Japanese in World War II. Yes. For about two weeks. Yeah. They entered the war one day after Hiroshima and two days before Nagasaki, and Putin is celebrating World War II in the Pacific. Well, uh, it isn't even clear be, uh, they were what they were fighting for, because if you look at the war memorials in that part of China, which I've done, they all say in Russian, fallen for the motherland. Uh, they say nothing about China. Stalin's plan was that all that was going to become Soviet. The future is secure. It's the past that frightens us, is the paraphrase. <laughs> so let's turn to that. Arthur, this parade in Beijing, it has no audience. Everybody's told to keep their windows shut and Isn't turn away. Most turn away. Be, but it establishes to me that they're frightened of something. Something worries them about the past. They're worried about an embarrassment, somebody protesting, maybe another moment where somebody stands in front of a tank and in and has a photograph taken. Yes. Is is Xi Jinping's dip into fiction here is this a measure of fear uh, hesitation because he has to change history in order to feel aggrandized well i think that that's an excellent point because in the soviet union when they decided that they had to stop lying about stalin they could get rid of stalin and say well there was still lenin who was this wonderful man way back until 19 uh, 24. In China, where their uh, legitimacy has always been based on a claim to have resisted the Japanese, they now realize that history is catching up with them, archives are being opened. Ordinary Chinese know, you, I mean, there are ordinary books in China that show 200 uh, government divisions, two uh, communist divisions, and so forth. They have to lie about the past in order to justify the present. So what, uh, 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 what's being acknowledged here, in a way, is that the legitimacy of the whole party edifice stands on sand. And that, that sand is, is, is being eroded away. And a huge attempt is being made to patch it, involving everything from the most advanced aircraft to a group of models, uh, lady models who used to work at, at uh, motor shows, uh, who have been tight, put into tight uniforms to sort of goose step in front of some group. So I think you're quite right. There is, this is a, a token of, of fear and a fear of the truth in the heart. And that truth would be uh, one that would be delegitimizing in a most dramatic way. About a minute, Gordon. Yeah, especially because Xi Jinping, the ruler of China, insists that the Japanese apologize. John, your assistant, Steven Eisenberg, just showed me a photo of Mao Zedong with the Japanese Prime Minister Tanaka and Mao saying, to Japan, there's no need to apologize because of you, we were able to defeat Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. Gordon Chang, Forbes.com contributor. Isn't history wonderful? The Chinese, no matter what, can't change it. Arthur Waldron of the University of Pennsylvania. I'm John Batchelor.